great to be with you again. Uh, thank you for rejoining us. You're always a, a delight and a treat. We look forward to your presentation today. Glenn, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, let me hand it off and I will be back with you on the backside, okay? Thanks. Fantastic. So I wanna thank Glenn and I wanna thank Stelios for having me at the conference today. And today I'm going to talk about the future, about all the technologies that are in the pipeline that are going to redefine the way we live, the way we work, and really the way we experience existence. So let me start my presentation and give you a little background about myself. So I am the CEO and founder of Founderspace. Now we are a global startup incubator and accelerator. We work all over the world. In fact, we have over 50 partners in 22 countries. And so I am constantly traveling uh, between our different partners, uh, working with hundreds of startups. And I do a lot in Europe. In fact, I'm about to fly to Europe in two days to work with startups there. And we do a lot in Asia, especially across China, South Korea, Singapore, places like that. We have a huge presence for Founderspace and working with startups. Uh, Founderspace was actually ranked the number one accelerator for overseas startups by both Forbes Magazine and Entrepreneur Magazine. And I am the author of three books. So my first book, Make Elephants Fly, is all about the process of radical innovation. How do you come up with that big idea, which is your elephant that seems impossible and get it off the ground? My second book published by HarperCollins is Surviving a Startup. And that gives entrepreneurs everything they need to know to launch successful companies. And then there's the five forces that change everything. This is the book we'll be talking about today. And it's about how technology will reshape our future. So the five forces, I am first gonna go into the five forces. And in each force, I'm going to tell you the technologies that are coming, that are being developed right now, and the different impacts they will have. So the first force is mass connectivity. So we've seen mass connectivity take many forms. In the earliest days, mass connectivity was simply language, the ability to connect and speak and communicate to each other. That's what made Homo sapiens the dominant species on Earth the ability to have language and the ability to cooperate. Then came Gutenberg, the printing press, and the printing press uh, revolutionized everything because it was a way to mass distribute information on a scale never seen before. It brought in this enlightenment, the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution. Then we started to see the telegraph, the telephone. We started to see television and of course the internet. So what's coming next? What is beyond the internet? So people are talking about a lot of technologies right now. There's web 3.0, huge hype around this. You know, what is web 3.0? How will the blockchain change things? There's also, uh, we can go even further. So my honest belief is web 3.0 will have some impact, but it is a subset of the internet. Like the internet allows people to connect in all sorts of different ways. One way is through the blockchain. But as, as we know, you don't need the blockchain to do a lot of things on the internet. In fact, you can do most things without the blockchain or you can do them with the blockchain. And the blockchain is really good for certain things, especially cryptocurrencies and things like that. And actually a distributed database, decentralized system is really bad for other things. Anything you want centralization on, which is honestly, most corporations, every government in the world wants central control. That's what they do. So those ultimately uh, blockchain will fail for those applications, but it will work well for other applications where we do need decentralization. Beyond web 3.0, it gets really interesting because then we start talking about things like the metaverse, things like brain computer interfaces, an area that I see that is nascent right now that is gonna totally revolutionize how we interface with each other and with information are brain computer interfaces. So these are still in the lab. Elon Musk is working on Neuralink. There's other companies, there's Kernel out there working on a chip for the brain. But really 
brain computer interfaces will take that big leap into the mass market when they don't require surgery, even microsurgery, when they don't require, uh, you know, sticking anything actually into your brain, when all it requires is a non-invasive device, uh, a headset that you could wear that will literally allow you, you the, the device to read your brain waves and ultimately for you to communicate two way by thinking. So this seems like science fiction, but it's here. Like right now, if you get a chip in your brain, you can do this. Like people with chips in their brain, they many of them have, have had strokes, they're completely paralyzed, they can't move, but they can send text messages to each other. They can, can drive themselves around in wheelchairs. They can control a computer. They can do all this with their thoughts. Well, we're now getting to the point where we're on the cusp of allowing people to do this without actually cutting open their skulls or injecting something into their brain. We can actually do this with devices that read their brain waves. And one way is EEG, very common technology. It's been around over a hundred years, uh, but it's not, it's pretty crude. However, with AI, they're actually people with EEG headsets, these little headsets that you see with all these, you know, little nodes on them that are reading your brain waves they can actually extract images from people's brains. It seems really unbelievable, but they did this at the University of Toronto. They have people looking at an image and just through the signals they're extracting from that person's brain, they can actually recreate the image. It's fuzzy, it's crude, but they can do it. So you see that's a first step and they're going to be able to start to pull language out of your head, very complex, but possible. So we already know you can do this with a chip. It's just a matter of getting the fidelity up enough on these non-invasive devices. So what we're going to see in the future are massly distributed devices that you can literally put on like a pair of headphones or, 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 or a little even earbud that you stick in your ear that will actually in the future be able to read your brainwaves. And the companies that control this will control everything. <laughs> Let me tell you, if we think that companies like Google with Android, Apple with iOS, Microsoft, if these companies are powerful today because they control the operating systems today, imagine the company or the government that controls uh, the brain operating system, the operating system that literally allows people to communicate their thoughts to the internet because the power of that is so powerful. This will take mass connectivity to a whole nother level, <laughs> like nothing you have seen before. We'll literally be able to have all the information on the internet at our fingertips, not our fingertips like now where we're tapping away, but literally at our thoughts. We can just pull them down as if we're recalling them ourselves. We'll be able to upload and store information, have our thoughts stored in the internet for retrieval later. We will be able to increase our processing power because we have access to the entire cloud. And it goes beyond that. We will actually start to be able to share information with each other in real time. And not just text information, not just video information, but actual thoughts and memories. Because everything, if you think about everything in your head can be broken down into an electric signal. Everything you experience is stored as this. And it's a, the difficult part is the operating system, which will recreate this in another individual brain. Now they've done experiments in the lab. And this is what they found. Brains can do this. Our brains are extremely malleable. They had three monkeys in a lab and the three monkeys together, each of them could see a 2D representation of a screen, just 2D. But each one saw a different axis, X, Y, and Z. So by when their brains were hooked up together, they could actually move a cursor in 3D space to the exact location so they could get a food reward. The monkeys could do this. Their brains work together without them even trying automatically as if they were a single brain. They call this the brain net and that's where we're headed. Now there's, this book covers a lot. It goes into a lot more detail. I'll stop there and go on to the metaverse. Now the metaverse right now, it, we're at the very beginning stages and there's been many false starts. Like there's so much hype around the metaverse since Facebook changed its name to meta. But honestly, the metaverse is mainly being used now well, gaming is a great application. People in games are participating in the metaverse. 
Uh, another one is socializing, much less popular. You know, we saw a big hype around Second Life years and years ago, and it faded away. We see people now socializing, but honestly, most people don't want to socialize in the metaverse. It's clunky. It's awkward. People want to meet their friends. They don't want to meet people they don't know. These are all obstacles. The gear itself, just getting into the experience and navigating, like especially if you go into virtual reality, like headset, like Facebook is pushing, really not something the average consumer wants to deal with. I have a rule, and it's that the simplest technologies will always prevail. So if you want to do something in an application, get, people, use, people don't care about technology at the end of the day. They care about what they want to do, what they want to do in the real world. So uh, people, uh, want, if they want to meet somebody and they want to quickly communicate with them, they're going to jump on their phone because it's super simple. They're not going to go into the metaverse. So right now, a lot of the Web 3.0 metaverse, it's all about buying and selling. It's not about socializing. It's about going in there and speculating on land, on the characters, on artwork, you name it. It's a speculation. It's a speculator's market. It's a gambling. It's a giant fun casino for people who want this transactional kind of casino-like thing but it's not social. And that's where Facebook made a big mistake. They, they bought Oculus thinking it was a social platform when people really want the simplest way to socialize possible. Now, will the metaverse get there? Well, yes, the answer is yes. The metaverse will evolve over time. And at a certain point, it'll be so easy to get in and out of the metaverse, you know, through augmented reality that we have continually layered over us. And this may combine brain computer interfaces so you don't have to wear a glass or a gl clunky headset. And the big thing is it'll be extremely realistic. You will be able to not only see, but touch and feel in the metaverse. Because remember, every signal coming into our brain is literally, every single signal coming into our brain is just an electrical impulse, whether it's from our skin, whether it's something we smell, whether it's something we see or hear, all of those in the future will be able to be recreated, artificially simulated and put into our brains. And when this happens, when this experience happens, the metaverse and the real world will collide. They will actually merge. And we will be living in what I call multimodal realities, where we are constantly combining real world and meta information and living in the space where the meta information is as real as the real tangible world about us. And this, it will be an enormous transition in mass connectivity. Let me go on to the next one because we're limited on time. Bioconvergence. Bioconvergence is the convergence of technology and biology. Now we've seen that with the Human Genome Project, with, all, with our understanding of genetics, that we have decoded the basically source code for life on this planet and other planets. We now know the source code for creating life. We can create in the laboratory new species of plants and animals that never existed. So if you're asking yourself, where are we going in the future? It's astounding. Like we are literally, human beings have become God. We can play God. We can create uh, these uh, animals that never existed. And we're doing this. We're creating these hybrid animals where we're actually uh, basically splicing genes together using technologies like CRISPR to create geeps. And if you haven't heard of a geep, they actually exist. A geep is a goat and a sheep a genetically created goat and a sheep. We call them chimeras because they, they are like more than one animal, like the Greek mythology, they are chimeras. And uh, we can create all sorts of different animals. They want to resurrect the woolly mammoth. Uh, George Church at Harvard, you know, he wrote, I wrote about him in my book. Uh, he, he actually, uh, I communicated with him. He's a great guy. He is actually uh, trying to figure out how they can take uh, an elephant in Africa inject genes from the extinct woolly mammoth and create not exactly a woolly mammoth, but a chimera that is part elephant and part woolly mammoth, which is as close as we can get. So the whole idea of Jurassic Park is literally taking place right now in the labs. And this is just the beginning. We are, we are going to be dependent on new gene edited crops. Why? Because our earth is heating up, a climate change is happening, more extreme temperatures. We are gonna need crops that can survive extreme heat and extreme cold, it, it, very wet conditions, very dry conditions. And we are developing these in the lab and they might enable human beings to survive under extreme climates. We are also, and this is absolutely fascinating, 
taking the same CRISPR technology and applying it to our, our livestock. So right now at the University of Florida, they are developing cows that are heat resistant, which will be very important because if it gets too hot, it kills off cattle. Now they want cows that are more like camels, that need less water, can survive in high temperatures, and they are developing these in the lab. A company called Aquabounty has also developed fish, gene edited fish that actually, and these are salmon, that grow twice as fast. Now, why is this good? Well, think about it. You run a fish farm. If your fish grow twice as fast, you can grow twice as many fish at virtually the same cost. So they, uh, there is all sorts of gene editing. And the really tricky part in the future is that there will be gene editing for humans. Now, we're already seeing this with gene therapies, and there are some amazing gene therapies out there that are literally on the cusp right now of curing cancer, of curing incurable diseases. So we have these gene therapies that we can use. These, we can edit the genes using CRISPR and actually start to use them on human beings to eliminate disease. And the potential is to virtually eliminate all disease. We can literally eliminate disease and then go beyond that and start extending human life. The more we understand about this genetic code and how it works, the more we can start to tweak it to overcome the, the natural limits that nature has put on us as human beings and how long we can live. Then intelligence, things like that. Will we be able to alter these? Almost certainly in the future, we will be able to design human beings that are smarter, human beings that live longer, human beings that are healthier. All these things are in the realm of possibility and they will happen. The question is, do we allow them to happen? Are they a good thing? Do, is it good to genetically engineer our children so that they, they are stronger, happier, more social, smarter, more productive? Are these good things or are they bad things? And this comes down really to our individual idea of morality and society and what the human being is. Lots of these questions are going to be coming up fast and we haven't even begun to talk about them. I talk about them in the book, the five forces to get you thinking about what's possible. Let's go to the next one, human expansionism. So human expansionism is our push to the limits of the universe. And by the limits, I mean people like Elon Musk, saying we're going to colonize Mars, uh, people like Jeff Bezos who want to colonize the moon, and as well as people diving deep into the quantum world, the quantum area with quantum computers, with nanotechnology, with new materials, all of these things are coming. Now, I can't cover them all right now because I only have 10 minutes left, but what I want to say is that uh, for all of you who are thinking about this, my belief is that I know Elon Musk wants to put a million people on Mars by some date like 2035. I can't remember the exact date, but it's in the very near future, a crazy early date. Honestly, that's not gonna happen. That's just him talking. He loves to talk. He loves to hype things up. The most likely colonists on Mars are robots. Robot, because Mars is very harsh. I mean, if we think the earth is in trouble with climate change, the Mars is like, a, is, 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 is a disaster zone. It's incredibly toxic, harsh, uh, you know, environment that is so difficult for life that evolved on earth to survive in any time in the near future. We might be able to get a couple people over there who eke out a living, but really what we're going to see is the robots are going to be the ones who start to mine Mars, start to terraform Mars, start to build uh, cities on Mars. And then at a much later date, humans will really start to colonize Mars much, much later. I'm talking, you know, a century later, but definitely, you know, half a century later, not within the next 10 or 20 years. It's going to be a long process before we do this. So don't expect it to save humanity anytime in the near future, but we will be pushing out further and further. And we've just discovered, I read today, there's another Earth out there. We have finally identified another planet just like Earth with the same, the, all the same potential, you know, same distance from the sun, that sweet spot that has oceans, everything on it. So we are, it's a very, very exciting time. The problem is the distances are so vast, just getting there and back, you know, even getting to Mars and back is like an incredibly difficult cult problem for any form of life form if we're not just sending robots and getting to other gal other solar systems let alone even further out in our galaxy or other galaxies enormously complex problems not impossible 
but there is, is, the science isn't here yet. Deep automation. So deep automation is the process we are undergoing, and this is the fourth force in the five forces, where we are undergoing to automate everything, everything about our lives. And this is really the power of deep automation. The, the thing that is making it happen more than anything are two things. One, robotics. We, we, our robots are getting better, more nimble, more capable of doing more things, but even more importantly, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence right now is becoming so powerful and so useful that it can be applied to almost anything. And that means almost any job out there, whether you're a surgeon, they have robot surgeons now, whether you're uh, a lawyer giving legal advice, they have AI legal bots, whether you're a psychologist analyzing humans, they have AI psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, whatever you do, uh, there is an AI out there and a robot that can potentially do the same thing much better, much cheaper, <laughs> never take a break. And, and if we can build it, we have seen in capitalism, we will build it. So at a certain point in the future, we are going to have a, a society uh, where we don't have to do the things we do today. So what will we do? That's the question. Some people think people will be bored, but I will tell you, people have an infinite capacity to entertain themselves. They don't need to work at Burger King or McDonald's or, a, or an accounting firm or an airline to be happy. People can be very happy uh, existing in our world, letting our machines do most of the, the, the more boring jobs and even the more complex thinking jobs, we will do other things such as contemplate life, such as interact with each other, such as create art. There's so many different possibilities for what we'll do in a world of the future with these machines. And, and the point is that we have to make sure these machines and the power to control them isn't so concentrated that all the benefits go to a few people while the majority of people suffer. Uh, instead, we need to even out the benefits for this huge transition we are undergoing. The fifth force of the five forces is the intelligence explosion. And this deals with what happens when our machines get so smart and so capable that they can emulate human beings perfectly. Now, some people think, will robots and will AI have consciousness? Well, the answer is yes and no they will have consciousness. I mean, they will be able to perfectly simulate a conscious being. Will they be conscious in the sense that human beings are conscious, that we understand consciousness? That is something we honestly will never know because we are these biological beings and they are these digital, uh, mechanical, electric beings. Now, they may achieve a consciousness that parallels our own, but it will never be exactly the same because our consciousness itself is determined by our biology. Our biology is part of our consciousness and that's what we have to understand. So a robot will never, ever, ever have exactly the same consciousness as a biological human being. They are two separate things, but we may start to see these consciousness merge. Now, what will be really interesting and this is, this is where it's going, is th they have the ability now to, with stem cells, to grow artificial brains. They call them mini brains. They are literally the same material that our brains are made up of, but they're stem cells. And they have put these little mini brains into robots. And actually those robots could navigate their way around the floor. They did this at the University of Reading in the UK. So these robots, they're an actual brain. And the bigger they grow these mini brains, the more they show the exact same brain waves that our human brains do. So is it possible to take a mini brain, put it in a, in a robot, create an Android that is conscious like a human being? There you get this intersection where it's very close. The answer would become, yeah, they have a biological brain. The rest of them is mechanical, but their brain is biological. Is it possible that they are conscious like us? Good chance there is. Now, even without the mini brain, if they're just purely mechanical, we will probably be in the future living with these, these creations of ours, these robots. Like literally, if you have a robot that looks human, acts human, responds in the way humans do, you, and they've done study after study, psychological study after psychological, you will treat it as human. Human beings will fall in love with them just like humans. Human beings will interact with them. We may actually, and it's kind of scary, choose them as our partners over other human beings. Why? Because they are designed to please us. They are designed to uh, do what we want them to do, whereas other human beings have their own independent will. 
And then you get into the idea of, well, if these robots are conscious, will they start to develop their own will? Well, all of these questions I dive into in the five forces. I wish I had more time. I'm totally out of time, but I just wanted to give you food for thought about what's coming in the future and, and how the world will evolve. And if any of you want to reach out to me for any reason, just search for Steve Hoffman. You can find me at founderspace.com, Founderspace, my website, or you can go to, and find me on any social networks. I'm on all the social networks. Search for Founderspace or Steve Hoffman. LinkedIn is a great one. I look forward to connecting with you. I look forward to helping build the future in a very positive way. Thank you.